This is Nightly Business Report with Bill Griffith and Sue Herrera. I would say that it's more likely that a deal will happen. Trade thaw. Optimism abounds that the U.S. and China will reach a deal and the market responds. Who pays more? Calls to tax the rich are growing, but do the numbers match the rhetoric? And value hunting. This week's market monitor says there are bargains to be found, and he has three names he thinks belong in your portfolio. All that and much more tonight on Nightly Business Report for this Friday, February 22nd. And we do bid you a good evening, everybody, and welcome. Sue has the night off tonight. Optimism was all the rage today in Washington as the U.S. and China agreed to extend their trade talks for a few days, fueling sentiment that a deal might be hammered out before next week's tariff deadline. President Trump also confirmed that he will meet with his Chinese counterpart next month. Stocks responded to that news, and we'll have more on that in a moment. But first, Kayla Tausche has more on the trade talks. After two days of cabinet-level negotiations and just one week before a critical trade deadline, both President Trump and the Chinese vice premier say a deal is more likely than not. I would say that it's more likely that a deal will happen. Uh, the fact that they're staying, and this is a very high delegation. This is a, uh, a man who is uh, revered all throughout China as the vice premier. So the fact that they're willing to stay for a, quite a bit longer period, doubling up the time, that means something. I think there's a good chance that it happens. Despite that optimism, the deal is not done yet. The Chinese delegation will be staying in Washington for two more days, after which point the president's advisors will recommend whether to extend that March 1st deadline. The president says there will be at least one more round of talks and then a summit between him and the Chinese president at which the biggest decisions will be made. So far, the U.S. team says there has been progress made on currency and on the issue of Chinese companies stealing the technology of their U.S. counterparts. And President Trump even said he'd be willing to consider dropping criminal charges against Chinese telecom Huawei in the coming weeks. All of this movement coming nearly one year as this trade spat has escalated, but potentially the end is in sight. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche in Washington. And coming up, we will look at how tariffs are impacting the multi-billion dollar home improvement sector. But first, a look at today's market rally. Fueled by this trade optimism, the Dow rose 181 points today to close back above 26,000 for the first time since early November. The Nasdaq was up 67, the S&P added 17. And for the week, the indexes were all up less than 1%. But for the Dow, this was its ninth straight week of gains. Its longest win streak, by the way, since May of 1995. One concern still hanging over the market, though, corporate earnings, which are expected to slow this year. And if they slow too much, there's even fear of an earnings recession. But does that necessarily mean the market will go lower? Pop Bassani takes a look. Does an earnings recession mean the stock market will drop in 2019? No, it doesn't. We're still in the longest bull market on record, yet the entire trading community seems convinced the bull's about to roll over. Last year's 6% decline in the S&P 500 is being hailed as proof that the market sniffed out an earnings recession. That's where earnings drop at least two consecutive quarters in a row. This news is being greeted with the usual round of hand-wringing from the analysts and strategists, many of whom are predicting little, if any, upward movement in stocks this year. The truth is this. Historically, there is very little evidence that a decline in stocks always indicate an earnings recession, nor is the opposite true. There is little evidence that an earnings recession invariably leads to a decline in stocks. So what does matter? Well, it's useful to remember the two developments that historically have killed bull markets. First is a sharp and sudden price hike by the Fed. And the second is a recession. Now, the Fed, for the moment, seems out of the whole rate hike game. So that's not a major factor. This leaves a recession, the classic killer of bull markets. And that's where the fault lines lie. If you believe a recession later this year or in 2020 is imminent and unavoidable, then earnings growth will likely indeed decline, possibly by double digits with similar declines in stock prices. But if a recession is avoidable, it's quite likely the current flat earnings environment will not really amount to much in the long term. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange. 
There was a lot of Fed-related talk today. First, in the Fed's semi-annual monetary report to Congress, the central bank said that the U.S. economy maintained solid growth through the end of last year, likely expanding just under 3 percent for all of 2018. The Fed also said that consumer and business confidence remains favorable, but some measures have softened since the fall, mainly global economic conditions. In fact, Chairman Jay Powell will elaborate on all of this when he testifies on Capitol Hill coming up on Tuesday and Wednesday. In the meantime, Fed Vice Chair Richard Clarita said today that the central bank will keep an open mind as it begins a broad review this year of its monetary policy framework. He said that the Fed will look at whether it needs to let inflation run higher than its 2 percent target if it feels that prices have grown too slowly, and also whether the Fed should expand its toolkit to fend off future downturns. And finally, Fed officials say they will look at possibly tweaking their communication strategies. Clarita also said the Fed will make the results of this review public in the first half of next year. Let's turn now to Matt Maley to talk more about all of this, the Fed, trade, possible earnings recession, and what it means for the markets. Of course, he's equity strategist at Miller Tabak. Welcome back, Matt. Hi, Bill. How are you? I'm fine. And here we are, the ninth straight week of gains for the Dow. It doesn't feel like the market's concerned about an earnings recession or about trade and tariff issues or about the Fed. What do you think? Well, I am a little worried about the, uh, the earnings recession because one of the things that we have with the Fed is that, uh, back, for instance, back in 2015, we, we had the last earnings recession. Right. The Fed was easy, easing through their QE programs. Uh, this time, uh, the Fed is not easing. In fact, they're still uh, they're involved in QT and, still, and just the opposite. In other words, they're still shrinking their balance sheet. So even though they've changed their tone quite a bit, and they have changed their actions to a degree, too, because they're not no longer raising interest rates, they're still tightening slightly here. So if earnings do continue to, to move lower as we move through the year, it will be a concern for me. Again, I'm not turning wildly bearish here. I'm just saying that after a huge move that we've had, I mean, nine weeks in a row is, is good, right. but usually after nine weeks in a row of a rally, it, 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 it falls off a little bit. And uh, the economy itself, uh, you know, we're, we're subject to the what's going on globally. We've talked about this in the past here. Uh, if we're seeing a global slowdown, inevitably it, 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 it eventually ends up here because of trade concerns and things. What about that and its impact on the stock market? Yeah, and that's the same thing. We have a combination of, of slowing global, global growth. And even though the U.S. economy is doing better than, than the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world, it's still slowing as well. So if you get a combination of slower earnings growth and slower uh, economic growth, it's just hard for the market to, to rally a lot more, especially yeah. after it's rallied 18 percent off its lows. Yeah. And after the Fed minutes uh, the other day, there were those who felt like maybe the Fed is going to have to raise rates by the end of this year. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. You know, for that to happen, we definitely need to see things pick up uh, quite a bit more and, the, the, you know, turn around and, and move higher. That's not out of the question if this uh, trade uh, deal is a substantive one. I'm not sure if we'll get that. But if we have a substantive one that eases, uh, you know, uh, uh, business leaders to uh, give them more confidence to spend more money, that could certainly be uh, something that, that, that changes the Fed's thinking. So what does your portfolio in stocks look like now? Are you more defensive? Uh, are you going for growth? Are you looking at value? What are you doing right now, Matt? Definitely uh, a little bit more on the defensive side, mostly for the reasons I've just cited. Right. Uh, but again, I don't want to overstate it. And the one thing is, is that's very positive, a lot of people are talking about the negative thing about how all these FANG stocks have, have rolled over, but actually the rest of the group has kind of picked up the pace. So we've seen that actually the, the broad tech group is, is doing better rather than just a few concentrated names. So uh, there, there's some areas where you can still pick your spots and, and find some good value. All right. Matt Maley with Miller Tayback. Always good to see you. Have a good weekend. Thanks. You too, Bill. Thank you. Now back to trade. And with that March 1st tariff deadline still looming, the home improvement sector is getting ready for its spring season. And as Courtney Reagan tells us now, tariffs have become part of their conversation for this hot area of consumer spending. As trade talks continue between the U.S. and China, the trade show must go on. True Value holding its biannual hardware, home and garden buyer trade show in Dallas as more than 400 vendors who import goods from China could see tariffs increase from 10 to 25 percent as early as next Friday. And that's on top of steel, aluminum and other tariffs instituted last year. 
as business people we get that something needs to be done to level the playing field. None of us like price increases. Our, the, the end consumer doesn't want to pay more. Um, our store owners don't want to pay more and then have to charge their customers more. Americans spend $10 billion on home improvement products that are now subject to tariffs. Items like hammers, vinyl flooring, and cabinets. A tariff of 25% could add $2.5 billion to the total price consumers pay. Rust-Oleum is the world's biggest manufacturer of spray paint. The company is already facing rising freight and labor costs, and tariffs on steel cans and some raw materials are adding to cost woes. We do a lot internally as a company first to make sure we don't have to give a price increase. And then when we, when we just push to the wall and every, we've done everything we can, then we go out with a price increase. Only the fifth price increase in two decades, and the first as a result of tariffs. Voorhees says there was initial margin pain, but the price increase helped profitability recover. In a letter to the U.S. Trade Representative, the CEO of Sunjo Snowjo says tariffs could make its products, including pressure washers, leaf blowers, and hoses, quote, substantially more expensive for consumers. But in cases like lawn and garden giant Scott's miracle Grow, the grass is greener on the other side. The company says tariffs are having only a really modest impact, and the sprayers on one of its pesticides containers, initially subject to tariffs, got an agricultural exemption. As the March 1st tariff deadline approaches, the home improvement sector waits to see whether a deal can be hammered out as its busy spring season takes off. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Courtney Reagan in Dallas, Texas. Time to take a look at now at some of today's upgrades and downgrades. We begin with Morgan Stanley upgrading shares of Intel from equal weight to overweight. It's turning bullish on that stock now for the first time in seven years. The analyst said that the chip maker can benefit from a new CEO and he feels it's undervalued compared to its peers. Price target now raised from $55 to $64 a share and the shares closed at $52.49. That was up 2% today. Jefferies is upgrading City from hold to buy with the firm seeing the bank improving revenue growth in the U.S. as well as adding benefits from growth in Latin America. Price target $73.00. City, though, fell a fraction today to $64.14. Jeffries also raised Planet Fitness from hold to buy. The analyst sees the company benefiting from the growing wellness trend. Big price target, though, hike from $49 all the way to $75 a share. Today's shares closed at $58 even. And Wall Street hit the eject button today on Kraft Heinz as six firms downgraded the shares and removed them from their buy lists. Last night, recall the company reported poor earnings. It slashed its dividend and revealed that the SEC had issued a subpoena looking into some of its accounting practices. And in its downgrade, Barclay said that there is simply too much uncertainty to continue recommending that stock. Kraft Heinz shares lost more than a quarter of their value in today's trade at 34.95. Mobile World Congress, that is the massive conference for electronics and telecom companies that gets underway next week in Barcelona. And the focus this year will be on 5G technology. Yesterday, President Trump weighed in on that topic with this tweet. He said, I want 5G and even 6G technology in the United States as soon as possible. It is far more powerful, faster, and smarter than the current standard. American companies must step, their, step up their efforts or get left behind. He continued, there is no reason that we should be lagging behind on something that is so obviously the future. I want the United States to win through competition, not blocking out current, currently advanced technologies. We must always be the leader in everything that we do, especially when it comes to the very exciting world of technology. And in fact, today, FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr said the U.S. is actually not that far behind. We're actually in really good shape right now in the U.S., and that's thanks to a lot of regulatory reforms that we've been engaged in over the last two years. And the White House has also been helping to lead the way by prioritizing 5G. In fact, a report just out this week said that the U.S. is projected to have twice the number of 5G connections uh, as Asia by percentage basis. So there's more to do, but we're heading very much in the right direction. So what exactly is 5G and what does it do? John Ford explains. What's so special about 5G? Well, 1G brought us phone calls. 2G, texting, 3G, web browsing, and 4G, 
video streaming. 5G promises to make all of that faster, but maybe more important, it should make room for a flood of new gadgets like self-driving cars, smart homes, weather sensors, traffic lights, security cameras. With 5G, all of them can be connected at the same time without causing a traffic pileup of data. It all works because three characteristics of 5G make it a potential game changer. One, it's fast. How fast depends on how it's set up. For phones, top speed should be not only a bit faster than 4G, but unlike 4G, which can be bursty, 5G phone speeds are more consistent. Two, it's agile. In the world of data, that's low latency. It means the time between you asking to play the video and the video starting to play, much shorter. That's a big deal for things like driverless cars, which will be reacting to traffic warnings and other alerts from the network. Three, it has endurance. When it's set up for communicating with sensors, 5G networks don't make devices use as much power to communicate. For Nightly Business Report, I'm John Fort. Up next, taxing situation, how the income tax system relies heavily on the very people many politicians want to pay more. As part of their proposed tax plans, many Democrats claim the wealthy get special breaks and pay lower rates than the rest of the country. But a closer look shows that that might not be the case. So who really pays more? Robert Frank digs into the numbers for us. They are the two words that have become a rallying cry for Democratic candidates. Fair share. Start asking the people who have gained the most from our country to pay their fair share. But the share of taxes actually paid by the wealthy are near or at an all-time high. The Tax Policy Center projects that the top 1% will pay 43% of all federal income taxes this year. That would be a record. The bottom 60% of taxpayers pay 4% of income taxes. Of course, the reason that the wealthy are paying a higher share is that their incomes have soared along with the share of the nation's pay. The top 1% will earn about 20% of total adjusted income as of 2016. That's double what it was in the 1980s. And many say the wealthy can afford to pay even more, especially as inequality grows along with the calls for more social programs. We need to raise taxes on high income households uh, for two reasons. One is their income has skyrocketed. The reason their share is so high is because their income is so high. The other reason we need to raise taxes on the rich is that we have this long-term budget issue where we'll either need to raise taxes or cut spending. But the real battle is over the rates paid by the top earners. Despite claims that the wealthy get special breaks or lower rates than the rest, the rates they actually pay, known as the effective tax rates, are still the highest for the wealthy. The 1% paid an average rate of 27% in 2016. The middle to upper middle income earners paid only 11%. Now conservatives say rather than raising taxes on the wealthy, government should instead cut spending. If you wanted to just raise taxes, which I don't advocate, I think we primarily have a spending problem, you'd have to raise taxes about 10%. If you wanted to balance the budget, you'd have to raise it 30%. As we head to the 2020 election, the taxes paid by the 1% are sure to get a lot more attention. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Robert Frank. A change at the top at AutoNation, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. Longtime CEO Mike Jackson said today he is going to step down from the car retailer March 11th and he'll be replaced by Carl Liebert, who is currently the chief operating officer at financial services company USAA. Separately, the company reported earnings and revenue that was below estimates. Shares of AutoNation fell 3% today to 37.23. Wayfair had a banner holiday season, topping quarterly earnings and revenue estimates. The online furniture retailer also reported a 15% surge in its active customer count. Shares hit their highest level since Wayfair's IPO back in 2014. It was up nearly 28% today to 149.95. Canadian mining company Barrick Gold is reportedly considering making a hostile bid for rival Newmont Mining for as much as $19 billion. 
that potential merger would be one of the largest mining deals ever and would create, uh, making Barrick the largest gold producer in the world. And late today, Newmont responded to those reports saying its own $10 billion acquisition of Gold Corp announced in January was, in its view, enough to produce solid growth in the future. Barrick shares fell more than 2% today to 1304. Newmont shares were up 3% to 3648. And Stamps.com is ending its exclusive partnership with the U.S. Postal Service. The company says with Amazon disrupting the shipping business, it needs to be free to do deals with competitors like FedEx, UPS, and even Amazon. But it comes at a cost. Stamps.com said that ending its deal with the post office means it will only earn roughly half what Wall Street was expecting for this year. And that's probably why shares plummeted almost 58% a day to $83.65. Time now for our weekly market monitor. He's a value investor. He has names of companies that he says are a bargain at the market right now. This is his first time on the program. Michael Liss is Senior Portfolio Manager at American Century Investments. Good to see you, Michael. Welcome tonight. Thanks, Bill. It's great to be here. And we start with Zim Biomed, a, a medical device maker that was founded in 1927. Now, I looked at a chart today, and it's been hovering for the last few years near an all-time high but you still feel it presents a value. Why? I do, Bill. Zimmer Biomet is a manufacturer of artificial hips and knees, and it's in a very consolidated industry. The top four manufacturers have nine, roughly 90% of the market share. Barriers to entry are high, keeping out new competitors. So the returns on capital are high, and because demand for their products are stable, those returns on capital are stable as well. And so Zimmer has run into some issues with their integration of Biomet right. on the manufacturing side, but they're solvable, and we think with a little time and okay. some a little extra spending, uh, we'll think they'll be able to, to figure that out. All so right. it's good returns on capital, very stable returns on capital, and a very cheap valuation. We think it's a good risk reward. Okay, U.S. Bank, number five in the country. <clears throat> it's recovered nicely in the last 10 years after the financial crisis, but again, you still see value there. It has. You're, you're right, Bill. It has recovered nicely. But uh, we think there's still more to go. So they're, the, as you said, the fifth largest financial lender in the country. They have industry-leading returns on capital, and those returns on capital are relatively stable compared to peers. They have a strong balance sheet, and they have the highest credit rating amongst their peers. We really like their diversified revenue stream, both made up of the lending business and very strong fee revenues. Okay. And so they had extra spending that they had to do in 2016 and 2017. It's rolled over. We think the margins will start to begin to expand into 2019. It's a cheap valuation, leading returns on capital in their industry, strong balance sheet, 2.9% dividend yield. Okay. Good valuation. We think it's a good risk reward. All right, we have run out of time, but I will just mention that you had Devon Energy as number three of value there, and it has been down for the last few years, so we do see maybe some value there as well. Michael Liss with American Century Investments. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Bill. Up next, we head west to Hollywood's biggest night of the year. I'm Julia Borston in Hollywood, where they're getting the red carpet ready for the stars on Sunday night. I'll tell you what to expect from an Oscar award show that's already been riddled by controversy. That's coming up on Nightly Business Report. The Academy Awards are Sunday night, and this year there's more pressure than ever for uh, them to draw viewers. Julia Borston is in Hollywood for us tonight. The Academy Awards isn't just about movie stars strutting the red carpet. It's also the ultimate ad for Hollywood, and the pressure's on to make this year's Oscars more compelling after last year's ratings fell to an all-time low. Movie going is under pressure, with more films on Netflix and other services streaming at home. And the box office is down 25% so far this year. The Oscars can provide a valuable box office boost. You know, Oscar nominations or even Golden Globe nominations, 
They provide really good free marketing for studios. But this year's show has been riddled with controversy. Kevin Hart dropped out as host in December after the revelation he sent homophobic tweets in the past, leaving the show with no host for the first time since 1989. And the Academy did an about face, reversing its decision to award four statues during commercial breaks after widespread protest. Changes to the show could help retain viewers over the course of the three hour plus telecast. But the big question is, after last year's ratings decline and with no host this year, will the Oscars be able to bring back viewers? One, action. Working in the show's favor and benefiting ABC, which airs it, Black Panther was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including Best Picture. This is the first time a superhero movie has been nominated for the Academy's top honor. Black Panther, which earned $700 million at the U.S. box office, is the highest grossing film to be nominated for Best Picture since Avatar back in 2009. Very big for Disney from a prestige standpoint. You know, it's not too often that we see the film that's the highest grossing film of the year also be perceived as the best film of the year. Along with Bohemian Rhapsody and A Star is Born, this year three Best Picture nominees have earned more than $200 million at the domestic box office. We'll see if the combination of commercial success and critical appeal of this year's nominees draws big numbers to watch the big stars Sunday night. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. Before we go, one final look of the day on Wall Street, a rally with hopes about the U.S.-China trade talks. The Dow was up 181 points. NASDAQ climbed by 67. The S&P added 17. That is Nightly Business Report for a Friday. I'm Bill Griffith. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great weekend. See you Monday.